Tone Benders, the Sound Designers Podcast. Here are your hosts, Timothy and Renee. Welcome to Tone Benders. My name is Renee Coronado, and with me today, as always, it's Tim Muirhead. Hey, Tim. Hey, Renee. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. I am at Renee underscore Coronado, and Tim is at Azimuth Audio. Tim, you got a chance to sit down and talk to a couple of my heroes, Ethan Van Der Rijn and Erica Dahl. Yeah, I did. We talked to them before, actually, in episode 35 of the Tone Benders podcast. So if you want to learn about kind of their history and their careers, uh, how they got to where they are, you can go back and listen to episode 35. Uh, you might know these guys from some of my favorite films like Argo and Tree of Life, some of Hollywood's biggest films like Transformers and Godzilla, and my son's favorite film, Trolls. He's four years old, so he just loves Trolls and the Kung Fu Panda movies. They yeah. did those as well. The Lord of the Rings movies, Ethan was on. So like they've just worked on some of the greatest stuff over the last few years. So they're, they're definitely heavyweights in the industry. And... Uh, but if, as I said, if you want to learn about their full career, you can go back and listen to episode 35 because today we're only going to be talking about the new film they worked on, A Quiet Place. And it's kind of a film that's kind of taking the world by storm. They kind of mention it in this interview about how uh, it was just going to be kind of a small release and then it started playing in film festivals and audiences went nuts for it. The distributors started going, okay, we got to get this in more theaters. We got to get more advertising behind it. And it came out and it was number one in uh, many, many countries around the world the week it came out. And I think one of the reasons it's number one is because of the soundtrack, which is kind of a weird thing. It's a film that uh, the plot conceit is based around sound. So they had to bring in somebody that knew what they were doing and someone that could uh, really make this project work because if the soundtrack didn't work, the film doesn't work. I saw a weird thing months and months ago in like a Hollywood reporter or something like that. Someone linked on Facebook to this article about this movie that was coming up and the plot. And I thought, oh my God, we got to talk to whoever's doing this movie. So I went and tried to research who was doing it and I couldn't find it and I couldn't find it. And then recently IMD popped up with Eric and Ethan's names as the sound designers. Having talked to them before, I was able to reach out to them and get them to sit down and have a talk with us just about this film and, uh, it's a pretty cool talk, so I'm really excited that you guys are going to get to hear this because uh, after seeing the movie, I really had a lot of questions. It's a cool movie for sound. so That's super uh, exciting. So should the listener like stop down and go watch the film first and then listen to this episode? or There are some spoilers coming up. That's the truth. Uh, <laughs> but it's, I don't know if there's a major spoiler, but uh, there's definitely scenes in the film are broken down in fair detail that... Uh, aren't the opening scene, if you know what I mean. So, although the opening scene is talked about too, the opening scene's an amazing scene. I love the opening scene, but uh, anyway, so yeah, I would suggest the ideal way to do this is to go see the film, see it in a theater because it's a, one of these communal experiences. Uh, I think I mentioned this in the interview coming up, but you can listen to it again. Uh, when I, when the film started, you could hear it's so quiet, the film, you could hear everyone eating popcorn. You could hear everybody slurping on their straws and people whispering to each other. And then about five minutes into the film, that just stopped because the film's so quiet and you get sucked so into it that everyone just put their popcorn down. All you could hear was people breathing. It was the quietest screening I've ever been in. It was pretty awesome. Nice. Ideally, go see the film, then listen to this. But if you don't have a chance to see the film, or even if you don't want to see the film, if you don't find it interesting, there's lots of stuff that they dig into that's pretty cool just for any film that would relate to any film or any kind of work that you want to do. Yeah, I got to work up my courage because I'm not a huge horror film guy. Like horror films actually legitimately scare me. <laughs> and so I gotta, I've got to go I'm check actually it out. in the same boat. This movie is kind of like... A, an intersection of the genres of horror, suspense, drama, and nature documentaries, if you can believe. <laughs> it's like got this weird, it's not a horror in any typical sense. It does have kind of like uh, those scare moments where there's quiet, 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 loud. But it's more of a suspense thing and a sci-fi thing. And there's lots of uh, quiet nature in it as well, which is kind of interesting. Nice. So where do you start here? Yeah, the first thing I asked them was how long ago they got in on the project and how they decided to tackle such a sound intense film and uh, eric started with the answers so eric is the first voice you hear and ethan will be the second voice you hear yeah well thanks tim it's uh, it's great to be back here chatting with you again 
Um, let's see. The whole adventure started really last June when uh, Ethan and I were approached by um, the producers, Andrew Form, Brad Fuller, and um, Michael Bay, who we'd all worked with before. And uh, they were interested in having us meet with John Krasinski, the writer and director and uh, actor. So the first step was they, before that happened, they gave us the script to read and right off the bat, we were blown away by the potential for sound. Um, there was almost no dialogue in the script, and uh, there, one of the main characters, the daughter, was deaf. And so right off the bat, we thought, oh my god, this is a sound designer's dream. And also, it's going to be really, really, really hard. <laughs> <laughs> so we met with John, uh, John Krasinski, and before we could say anything, he said, this is a sound designer's dream. <laughs> so he said, yeah, okay. we know. <laughs> we know. Our line. You beat us to the punch. <laughs> and, uh, and, but it was so exciting because he knew and, you know, the producers knew how important sound would be, that sound was in the DNA of this story. So um, we were really flattered to be invited to be, become a part of it. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, in the New York Times, there's a big article that uh, I believe Ethan is interviewed in. No, we, that we both it's almost are. like they're promoting the film through the sound design. I don't know if I've ever seen a film that worked like that before. It's I'm, pretty interesting. Yeah, it is really yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting <laughs> experience. I mean, you know, I think it's for, for both Eric and I, I think it's the first film that we've worked on where the sound really is a real character. You know, it's almost like the sound is the nervous system of the film. And... That's what we, you know, when we first read the script, we kind of realized it was going to be that way. And then as we started to work on the film, we sort of made all these discoveries along the way that sort of just enhanced that whole idea that the sound really could take it to this whole other place. And it could do something which we really haven't been able to do in too many other films where we could just keep stripping away layers of sound, you know, and get down to the actual point of absolute no sound, of total zero, uh, which we've not really been able to do too much, but always sort of dreamt about and create this sort of interesting dynamic with the audience where the audience gets sucked into what's happening because we force everyone to be so quiet and it just creates a whole new dynamic a whole new experience i think that that we haven't really felt before in a in a film and i think that's one of the reasons people are talking about the sound so much you know i mean we work on a lot of very sound intensive projects but I think there's been more interest in the sound on this film than really anything. And I think it's because of how quiet it is and it makes the audience a participant. And in the theater, everyone's holding their breath and trying not to make a noise and leaning in. You know, when you when you have louder movies, it kind of in a way kind of lulls you and comforts you and. You, you're reminded it's a movie and something about the, the negative space with the sound of this film, I think, um, rips away that security blanket and makes it kind of a really interactive uh, experience. And I think it's a lot more uncomfortable to be in silence. Um, it's kind of a novel experience this day and age, you know, <laughs> to experience quiet you know we're so bombarded with stimulus and sound and noise and to have that quiet is really unsettling and especially in, in this story in this film it's survival if you make a noise that's too loud you're dead you know sound is uh, the danger and 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 sound you know no spoilers but sound can be a weapon yeah the experience that i had when i saw it i saw it in a packed theater and when the uh, the jolt moments happen, instead of screams, it was exhales. Like there was no <laughs> loudness from the audience. It was just all of a sudden, <gasps> I can breathe again. It was, and people at the beginning of the movie, you could hear popcorn rustling and people sucking on the straws of their drink. And as the movie went on, the sc screening just got silent, just oh, nice. dead silent nice. in the movie and like on that screen and in the room. Yeah. And I don't know if I've ever experienced anything like that. No. And exactly. you mentioned that it was interactive. And I think one of the things that pulls you in is that there's 
sound perspectives based on the character that we're with at different times. So uh, you mentioned the deaf character, the mm -hmm. daughter. Mm -hmm. You go into her perspective of hearing, well, kind of two perspectives of her with the cochlear implant and then when it's not a cochlear implant. And then you get the creature's perspective a few times. Uh, I wanted to ask you how you guys, did you know that going in that you were going to do that? Was that in the script or did you guys kind of discover that along the way? We, d we discovered that along the way. It's something um, we discovered like basically very early um, because the first two scenes we started with were the opening of the movie um, starting, you know, in the store, the very opening through the trestle bridge attack. That was mm -hmm. our first sequence we attacked. And we realized pretty early on in that sequence that we wanted to be able to be with Regan, the deaf character, the daughter. We wanted to feel with her. And so then we started experimenting with really pulling down the sound and what would what would her experience of this situation be where she sees the panic and fear on her dad's face, but she doesn't know what he's reacting to because um, I don't want to spoil too much, but her brother is behind her um, making the noise and all she does, she sees the panic on her dad's face. And so we wanted to put the the audience right there with her. And so we just started experimenting with pulling away layers and just playing around with the idea of what, what does it sound like? What does the world sound like to someone with a cochlear implant? And part of that was based on Mila Simmons, the actress who plays that character, uh, her and her mom talked to John Krasinski, basically trying to explain to him what what her experience was of, you know, with the cochlear implant turned on. And he, you know, he talked to us about that. And so we, we kind of based it on that description. Mm -hmm. That says she's with, with her cochlear implant, you know, uh, I don't know if we said that Millie, um, the actress, is deaf herself. And which was, um, for John, uh, non-negotiable. He wanted a real deaf person um, to play that character. And uh, they didn't audition anyone other than her. And, oh, but, wow. Yeah. And, but she was really um, eloquent describing through sign language and her mom translates what her experience is. And with the cochlear implant in, it's not total silence. There is this very low kind of hum, um, almost an internal little rumble. And it's almost more like the sound of very delicate touch that's very muted. And for ourselves, we kind of interpreted that through our own experiences um, with like anechoic chambers where you're completely deprived of any sound around you. The only sound you wind up hearing is your internal sounds, like the blood moving through your veins and your, your breathing and where the sound is very tactile. Your whole body is an ear, essentially. So um, that's kind of was our design starting point with what her perspective would sound like. And of course, when she turns her hearing aid off, um, we go to complete absolute silence, which um, I think is a first for me to have a track where there's absolutely nothing, no music, no room tone, no anything. It's a digital zero, which uh, strangely and counterintuitively created some of the scariest parts of the movie for me. <laughs> it's the juxtaposition of intensity visually with just nothing to, you know, nothing to support you um, sonically. And, yeah. and um, that, was, that was a real gift um, to, to be given the ability with the story and John's brave, you know, fearless directing um, to be able to go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also what that allowed us to do was explore all these different sort of subtle levels of silence, you know. I find it interesting, you know, the movie's, you know, being called a silent movie, when in actuality, in many ways, it's a very sound-intensive movie, just using a lot of different layers of exploring, different layers of, of quiet, really. Mm -hmm. And for just uh, expanding on what you're saying, that stripping out was critical to create, you know, um, the daughter, Regan, 
um, her point of view. If originally that whole sequence had temp music over it, and so the very first assembly um, that we got from the picture department, there's music going through all of that, and it completely wallpapered over, it just bulldozed any perspective. And we realized we really had to start taking stuff away. And that was the first thing we said to John, like, we need to take out the music for this beat, for that to register. And he was willing to try anything. And if it worked, awesome. So that was kind of one of the first discoveries. And then in terms of the Regan's envelope with the Creature's envelope, the very second sequence we ever worked on was the Cornfield sequence, where the daughter first has a close encounter with the Creature. And to me, that was just, you know, probably the most challenging scene, but also the scene where sound really does the heavy lifting. It really tells sure. the story and and explains what's going on in a way that doesn't use exposition or dialogue. It's like purely just pure sound. The one the one note I would attach to that is when we started working on that sequence, there was no uh, there was no creature in the shot. Right. So we were really just um, imagining basically what that would be like. And then also starting to imagine, we knew we were going to, once we, once we got the idea of creating this sort of sonic, uh, what we call, what John liked to call an, a sonic envelope for the Regan character, we, we knew that we wanted to explore it with the creature. Like, what is his experience of the world? Because we know he's blind, and he, so he, he's really experiencing everything th through his hearing. So we mm -hmm. knew that we wanted to explore what that would be. And that shot in the in the cornfield that Eric is talking about was the, our first place to try and do that. So we started experimenting with the idea of what he was hearing sonically before there was any creature there to attach it to. And then when the VFX started coming in, we realized, <laughs> okay, we need actually, we need ILM to extend some of these shots. So we had time to establish one idea from the creature's perspective, but then have it evolve and blossom into the next idea. And I think people who have seen the movie and heard the movie will know what I'm talking about. Maybe I don't want to spoil it um, mm. for those who have Spoil away, spoil away. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we needed time for the creature's ears to open and then sonically demonstrate that its hearing is incredibly amplified and it's hearing the insects in this cornfield on a whole nother level juxtaposed with the daughter's point of view of the cornfield, which is like almost nothing. And but then as its ears are opened and it's um, hearing the insects in this cornfield, it somehow starts to interfere and create feedback with her hearing aid. And then so we cut to Regan and she feels the pain of that. And then the creature is feeling the pain of that. And in a way, these two characters are kind of flip sides of the same coin, one with intense hearing ability, the other with like very little hearing. But somehow they're in this twisted way joined through through this <laughs> sonic experience. So that it was really the sound that helped create the visual architecture of that scene where we needed to extend to have enough time to have the sound evolve for the creature and then the logic of how we would cut. You know, quite a bit of the picture editing was kind of dictated by what we wound up doing with the sound. Especially yeah. especially around some of these envelope sonic POV moments because mm -hmm. yeah. uh, those are hard things to be able to figure out how to picture edit them until you have the sound design. So those are things that as we developed the sound design, fortunately, um, the, Drew, the producer, was here with us because the... The editing, picture editing rooms were in New York, and it was all happening very fast. Fortunately, Drew was here, the producer was here with us through a crucial period, and, and as we made some of these discoveries about the picture editing needing to adapt to what we were doing, he was able to just phone them in directly to John and say, hey, you know, this shot of the creature's ear, we really need to extend it longer. And then, it, you know, it could happen. So it was important that you know, everyone was talking to each other and to make things happen quickly. Mm -hmm. 
And there's a similar moment with a egg timer mm-hmm. that um, kind of the same evolution where we really kind of <clears throat> had to get a pass on the sound first to really tell us how the picture editing would wind up being most effective. Yeah, I mean, in fact, um, you know, the first time we saw the movie, we said to each other, you know, the way this really should work is kind of the way Terrence Malick likes to work, which is... Do your sound first and then cut the picture. Yeah, <laughs> and in many ways, like, it would have been great um, if if it could have worked that way. And it, it did a little bit, but a, a condensed version of it yeah. happening that way. That's really cool. It must be amazing to have that luxury. I'm very jealous that you guys got that. Something I wanted to talk about was uh, the way you guys had to, just by the nature of this film, which I've never seen a film quite like it before, but the nature of the film, you had to express silence through noise. Mm -hmm. So like an example that I noticed was when inside the house, there's all these painted spots on the floor where they can step and it won't creak. And the whole point is that when they step there, it won't creak. But you can't have it not creak. Like you guys had to put in little tiny little quarter semitone of creaks to make it work. And like how much effort was that? And how did you guys find those perfect sounds? Well, it's funny because, you know, I think many people might assume that, you know, a big, loud, bombastic movie is the hardest kind of sound job to work on. And it's actually the opposite. Um, A film that where everything is so stripped away and you're so naked sonically, um, it's actually just as hard, if not harder. And those are the little things, you know, we're walking such a tightrope, like what's loud enough, but not too loud so that we break the logic of the film and, and break the spell. And, uh, you know, for that example of um, Regan walking along the painted bits of the floor, that's a combination of a few things. The creaks are sound design and they're very, very th- delicate, barely the threshold of hearing. The flush just tapping against the wood came from our Foley team. And the Foley was shot in um, Toronto by Foley One, who recently they did uh, The Shape of Water and did a beautiful job on that. And we're happy to collaborate with them on this. Mm-hmm. But the whole movie is these delicate little balances, this knife's edge that you're walking on. <laughs> so, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, the other thing I whenever say something, about that. Whenever something was too loud, you know, either Drew or John would say, they're dead. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but just in terms of highlighting silence by playing sounds, I think the key is really about perspective. And just like yeah. you already keyed yeah. in on, like, how small can we make a sound? in order to highlight how quiet everything is around it. And I think that's really the key to, you know, so much of what we do in this movie is is the idea of perspective and what's the right level for something to be depending on where it is in relation to us, the viewer, and also to where it is within the environment of the movie. Yeah, like a close-up, for example, has its own rules because you're right in on something so you can feel that intimacy a little bit more. But then you go into a wide shot, you're not going to hear it at all. So it's kind of like, you know, this sonic rack focus between perspectives. And then the the second part of that is what are the atmospheres, you know? Like when, when when we're in the quiet room, there's no backgrounds at all. It's just cloth and, you know, foley and, you know, gentle feet. When we're outside in the cornfields and out on the farm, we have airs and the sound of wind through corn leaves, corn husks, and and we have our, you know, beds of insects. And those things kind of create a different relative dynamic between the sounds that we then play. So everything's kind of relative, like everything affects everything else. And... um, that's kind of a fun journey in this film, too, because uh, without a lot of score, without a lot of dialogue, you can really experience that, you know, in a clear way. Yeah. And I, th- I think the interesting thing is uh, I feel like what we're talking about is things we work on 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 every project. We put a lot of effort into, you know, these details, exactly what we're talking about. What's so different about this movie is just what Eric said there isn't a lot of talking, almost none, and there isn't a lot of score. So basically all these details rise to the surface and that becomes 
you know, the character that becomes what the what the movie is about. And mm-hmm. it's it's so interesting because, you know, these are things that are in every track that we do. It's just they don't normally get the attention that they're they're getting in this movie. Well, and and also in this film there isn't that kind of like veil that haze of many other things going on at once whether it's score or right. other things you know it's the the act of finding the <clears throat> negative space helps define the sounds more starkly it's you know one thing that we've been discussing a lot the last few months is um, the idea of sonic chiaroscuro <laughs> to use a pain, <laughs> to use a painting term you know, painters like Caravaggio or Rembrandt have, you know, these shafts of light splitting through total darkness, you know, a real contrast. And and just applying that philosophy to sound, you know, the darkness is the negative space, the absence of sound, and the shaft of light is the sound we pick, and it and it makes the sound more powerful by surrounding it in, you know, in the quiet. And I think that uh, I think that might be one of the reasons people are really noticing the the sound because we're used to a plateau of just you know the Specter Phil Spector version of sound in these kind of movies. Not yeah, in these type of movies, and then also in so much of you know so much of real life um, as we go through the world, it's so rare to be in a place where you know, things get quiet enough that you can hear yourself breathing, that yeah. you can hear, you know, a gentle wind going through, <laughs> rustling through the leaves. Uh, you yeah. know, it's just it's just rare in life. And I think that's one of the things that this movie is drawing some attention to. And, you know, I think that's one of the captivating things about it, because people aren't used to listening this closely. I think this movie is forcing people to listen in a way that they're not used to listening. And, you know, for us as sound designers, that's a really cool thing. Yeah. Really um, cool. Ray, uh, Ray Kurzweil, and I'm trying to remember what it is. Is, is it the called the Silence Project or mm. is it? He speaks mm. really eloquently um, about how quiet is <clears throat> disappearing in the world you know just year by year there's fewer places um, where you don't hear human civilization and whether it's air traffic or weed whackers or cars and motorcycles and just the noise of humanity these days you have to go to the most remote regions of the world to to find that quiet <laughs> And this film kind of paints this scenario where all of that now is gone. All of the noise of humanity and machinery, it's gone. And it's kind of a reset button. And um, that's pretty exciting. And But it's so simple, too. And it's like, how did nobody ever do this before? <laughs> like, how is there not a script that kind of described that before? But... Um, well, Gordon Hempton talks a lot about that, too. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He uh, talks about the idea of finding one square inch of silence yeah. and finding a way to preserve that. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. But your film, uh, it goes a little bit further than that because the animals aren't really making any noises either in it. Yeah. So you're not hearing a lot of bird life in this film. No, uh, because if you make a noise, hearing, you're, uh, you're, you're dead. They're all dead, you know? Yeah, it's exactly. That, well, that, yeah. especially that poor raccoon that ha- yeah, he's gone. <laughs> I don't know how he yeah. made it that far, actually. Yeah, that's a good question. Chattering that much. Yeah, you don't hear any <laughs> single crickets either. You know, it's like anything that could get picked out of the background is going to be uh, the theory is that they're gone. It's only the swarm or the hive that kind of survive the school of fish approach. Um, so, did you guys do uh, field recording for that, or did you source out pre-existing recordings, or? We used our own recordings, um, but um, there was kind of a limited uh, recording budget and schedule. So uh, <laughs> we did use some of our, our favorite personal recordings that, that we've done to, for the atmospheres on the farm. So what was the time frame between uh, when you guys jumped on that and when you were finished mixing? How far was that? Well, um, I don't know if we I honestly don't know if we should say I don't know how many I don't know how many producers you have listening to this. Oh, right. <laughs> um, when, I don't know. It's uh, it, you know, it wasn't as luxurious. Um, you know, this movie was done for 17 million dollars. 
But Ethan and I were just talking, you know, total is the whole budget. Um, so it's not a giant schedule and a very, you know, slim, lean and mean sound crew. But uh, Ethan and I were just talking about it. That actually might have been a blessing in disguise because we could kind of do some wacky stuff and make some bold choices. And there wasn't really time to second guess it. And there wasn't time for a studio to freak out or, you know, <laughs> like it li like literally, I mean, the paint is still drying on this film. We just finished it like three weeks ago. Oh, wow. Uh, and um yeah, and even, you know, it premiered at South by Southwest, and um, we were still final mixing. Like, we still had some a few days to to go. And so, yeah, we just, like, halfway through the final, so, okay, this is what's going to Austin. And um, fortunately, the audience just went wild. And so whatever fears and, you know, um, that might have been there from the people paying for the movie... Um, <laughs> kind of evaporated really quickly and it gave us even more license to for not only preserve the direction we were going but even amplify it more mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so it it wound up like the way the timing all worked out i think was um was a blessing in disguise yeah and i mean i think the other thing that was a blessing is in disguise is the fact that it was for us a, a pretty low budget movie which Helps keep it more under the radar, and and I think makes it easier to be to make some bolder choices. Um, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of doing things like taking out all the sound in different moments and going to literal, you know, digital zero. Yeah, um, it's tougher to try and do things like that on you know bigger budget films with more money riding on it because there's a lot more people involved who are going to be mm -hmm. just. Too nervous, basically. So I think that was it's kind of nice for us to have that freedom to work on, you know, something small enough where uh, it was uh, we were given the freedom to do that, and not just the freedom, but really encouraged by you know John, who as Eric's already said, was completely fearless and really encouraging us to really explore deeply and just take it as far as we could take it. You know, not specifically, but just you know. You just like go for it in general, and he's so enthusiastic, and so he gets so excited about you know ideas that it's it's really really fun to collaborate with him in that way. He's John Krasinski has he is a real artist. The guy has such an amazing ear, and and I have to say that of all the we, we've worked with a lot of really demanding intense directors and. John is the most likable, insanely intense director <laughs> ever. <laughs> like it's 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 like he makes the crazy hard work um, fun, you know. And and uh, but man, he has a great ear. There was one. It was during our final mix. We were music editor had been working trying to like reshape uh, a moment towards <laughs> the end of the film and. Um, John was like, what's that little, I hear a little jump. And none of us on the stage were hearing what he was talking about. And finally, um, Brandon Proctor, who was um, mixing, went through every swim lane of automation in all of the music stems. And one of the many music stems had one tiny little, like, 1 dB automation, like, conform glitch. That's what he was hearing. He, wow. He, yeah, it was like the creature level of fear. <laughs> <laughs> he, in fact, he is the creature. I think he's based he's this loosely in, on in. himself. Uh, I mean. <laughs> well, speaking of the creature, uh, I'll let you guys go after we just talk about the creature a little bit, because I think we'd be remiss to skip over that, because that is uh, definitely a really cool part of the film. Uh, how did you guys go about getting the voice of the creature, let's call it? Well, it was a real, um, it was an evolution because obviously you can't just go out and record one of these creatures. Um, <laughs> just go to the zoo. Just go to the <laughs> zoo. Um, yeah, make sure you're not using a nagra because those make noise while they're recording. <laughs> um, we experimented with a lot of different things. And one of the starting points was that these creatures are essentially blind. So they use sound to navigate through their world and their reality. And sound is what kind of paints the geography of where they are. 
And so we were playing with, and this was a, I think John originally was pushing for us to try this kind of echolocation concept. So we started playing with clicks and those kind of things. And the creatures have kind of a few different modes and the echolocation clicks are kind of the searching mode. And Ethan, you can describe some of the other modes. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, obviously with the, one of the other main modes is when they're in, a, they found whatever prey that's making the sound that that's attracting them and so they go into attack mode and we tried a we we tried a lot of different things for the sort of attack mode and what we ended up doing actually is stripping it way back and focusing more on the visceral physical sort of power and size of these things so really focusing on the hits they would make as when they attacked and focusing on getting the weight from their feet and bodies as they were charging. And then the other, I guess... Also one of, their joint the visceralness. Jo- of yeah, the joints were exoskeletal, great. Exoskeletal, so they're kind of, you know, wet crab spider-like things. So we, that, that was really fun to kind of in the closer, yeah. you know, medium and close shots we could really play with. We can't say exactly what it was we used to make all the vocals, though, unfortunately. Following on the Godzilla philosophy, um, we don't want the audience to think about that yet. Um, Fair one enough. Day, one, day when we, <laughs> one day we will reveal all. <laughs> I can say one experiment. Um, one of the lead sound artists on the movie is Brandon Jones, and he uh, one experiment, which was a great idea, it just didn't work ultimately, but um, for some of the sh- more intense, agitated vocals for the creatures, he used a squeaky kitchen drawer, um, <laughs> and uh, which had this intense visceral kind of quality, but uh, we wound up um, moving on to something different. And like Ethan said, um, Less was more, you know, our original pass was a lot more busy, and we realized that once we started you know, taking out every, you know, three out of four of the vocals and giving some space between them, it just got way scarier because we did have some quiet contrasting those vocals. So, and I think that's, that's how you make an audience hold their breath. You know, it's uh, when they hear themselves breathing and they have to be quiet or they're dead. It's if the, if the creature were just blathering on the whole time, it would be a lot more comfortable an experience, I think. Yeah, and we did, like Eric said, we did have a pass that was more that way, and then, we, yeah, then we realized, um, you know what, let's start thinning it out, and the more we thinned it out, the scarier it got. Yeah, I believe it, because the screening that I was in, as I say, it was a packed house, and there was just a communal feeling of dread. The moment where the creature goes underwater, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. oh my God, the whole theater slumped in their chair and just like <laughs> grabbed their head and was like, what is going on? It can swim now? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually uh, much more well, comfortable for the creature underwater because it's more <laughs> muted and muffled. Uh, yeah. It's not as uh, irritated by noise. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations on all the work you did on it because it really worked and the entire movie would have fallen apart if the soundtrack didn't work because uh, it's the glue that held it together. And uh, I had a great time watching it and uh, great job, guys. So thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us and we'll let you go get your dinner now. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks. Thank Thanks. you so much, Tim. Thanks. All right. That was awesome. I can't wait to go see the movie now. I don't know why I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, it's definitely worth going to see. As I said, go see it in a theater. I think it would be worth that experience. It's a, it's a film that's got some plot holes in it that I think if you see it at home with other things in like interrupting you, uh, <laughs> it might ruin how you experience the film. But when you're engrossed in a theater with people around you, you just kind of let those plot holes slide by and just buy in. So I would definitely recommend going to see it in a packed theater if you can. It's amazing how moments of silence will just cause you to focus and, and really pay attention in a way that, um, that just constant barrages of noise won't. Yeah, they were conscious of that when they were designing the sound of this film, for sure. Yeah, it's cool. Well, awesome. Thank you for the interview. Thanks to Victor Zotman, sound editor and correspondent for Designing Sound, for giving us some editorial help on this particular episode. Yeah, he turned it around really quick so that we could get this out while the movie was still in theaters. So thank you very much, Victor. Uh, I also wanted to just send out a quick uh, 
call for help. I don't know if that's the right way to phrase it. Uh, if anybody out there wants to help us edit episodes in the future, it'd be great because both Renee and I are super busy with our full-time jobs. And uh, we're able to get these episodes recorded and kind of planned, but cutting up, uh, cutting out all the ums and ahs and getting them out to everybody, we could use a bit of help with. So if anybody out there does have a bit of free time right now, shoot us an email at info at tonebenderspodcast.com and uh, let us know. We put this call out probably two and a half years ago and we didn't get to everybody, but I feel bad shooting somebody an email two and a half years later trying to pin them down to something they volunteered to do that long ago. So if we could kind of start a new list, if you want, if you volunteered before and want to volunteer again, feel free. Uh, if you don't want to volunteer, then that's fine too, obviously, but uh, we appreciate all the support you guys give us. We've gotten great response from the entire community. It's just kind of amazing how, how willing people are to jump in and, and help get these out. It's very cool. Thanks to everyone who listens and participates in the show. Thanks so much to Ethan and Eric for jumping on and talking to Tim about this amazing film. Thanks to Stacey Dupas for letting us bend and twist her voice on our bumpers. You can follow the show at The Tone Benders and go to ToneBendersPodcast.com to leave a comment. You can support the podcast by shopping at ToneBendersPodcast.com slash Amazon or ToneBendersPodcast.com slash BH. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you all next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to Tone Vendors. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. If you listen on iTunes or Stitcher, please write us a review while you're there. To support the show, go to ToneVendorsPodcast.com and click through our Amazon link or leave us a tip. You can also download and listen to our entire show archive there and leave a comment on our site or on SoundCloud. Keep up to date by following at the Tone Vendors on Twitter or find Tone Vendors Podcast on Facebook and YouTube. Email us with your questions and ideas at info at tonebenderspodcast.com.